will be more about topological theory. Uh, I will <coughs> introduce to you uh, how do you define topological interlinkers in the most general situation in terms of the bad picture, but uh, in terms of topological theory, I can tell you what it is. And then I'd like to tell you about the new effects that we're still looking for. Uh, it's a directly predicted, but no experimental realization yet. And uh, last now I'll tell you about the uh, experimental consequences of this quality of the theory. So by now you know that about some of the standard uh, field theory, this is the famous one that I was referring to. <coughs> this is the uh, Maxwell's uh, action uh, in fast space when you expand out, it's e squared minus b squared. Again, uh, you have an action that's a uh, scalar. Uh, the fundamental quantities are either the vector potential, which is a vector, or the field tensor, which is a vector tensor. So you have to somehow make a scalar out of these uh, tensorial quantities. And uh, what uh, uh, occurs in the case of Maxwell, if you have two Maxwell in the space, is well, you will be contracting with the metric tensor. So this kind of quantity expressively depends on the metric, depends on the distance, and therefore depends on geometry. And that's, for example, why light gets bent by gravitational field. Uh, and this is uh, the action for the gravity itself. It involves this uh, Ricci scalar, and it involves this metric itself. And the Ricci scalar is also contracted by the <coughs> Ricci curvature, which is a tensor by contracting with the metric tensor. So the whole, uh, all the field theories that we know so far, a lot of, most of the field theories that we know so far, depends on the geometry or on the metric uh, of the system. So now, uh, the natural description of the topological state of matter. So we basically have these conventional uh, states, and they are basically described by these uh, uh, metric-dependent uh, uh, field theory uh, from uh, this uh, kind of order. You have an order parameter, and from the order parameter, you have a Uh, you can construct a few theory which depend on symmetry and so on, but uh, things that depend on symmetry naturally also depends on geometry. So these are described by geometrical or field theories. And now we have these kind of topological states of matter, and they should be described by something different, uh, which is the topological field theory. Okay, so just for a beginning student, it's very easy to understand when you read a book, a uh, mathematical book on topological field theory, you will never understand anything, or at least I will never. But I tell you that there's a very, very simple way to recognize what's topological and what's not. You see, all the other uh, field theory, uh, in order to construct the action scalar, you need to contract with the metric tensor. But in any given space time, there's always a unique possibility to construct, uh, to use the Levitivita tensor or the epsilon tensor. So this is a fully uh, invariant tensor, epsilon in a row, so that has three indices and then it's lived in two plus one dimensions. And uh, so you have external fields, uh, A, uh, which you can attach. So you have a given material, but you couple the given material to external gauge field. We know exactly how to do that through minimal gauge coupling or on a lattice through tireless substitution. Then you integrate out all the microscopic electronic degree of freedom, and what you get is effective action. And in two plus one dimension, such a term is allowed. So now let's uh, actually see a very interesting, and that's something we're going to contrast uh, later, that this thing has a very interesting uh, property under time reversal operation. Remember under time reversal, A0 goes to A0, but AI goes to minus AI. So when you expand out, so you just need to take, uh, if it's added, then it means all terms have the same symmetry. So let's just take the term 0, 1, 2, right? So you have A0, partial 1, which maybe means X, and a y or a two, right? So now you see that this is even under time reversal. This is even under time reversal because it's a space derivative. But this one is odd under time reversal. So this term, you say, in principle, it can occur in any two plus one dimensional system. But in order for the position c one to be non-vanishing, that system has to break time reversal symmetry. And that's what is meant for quantum Hall effect because uh, quantum Hall effect uh, has to exist only uh, when the time reversal symmetry is broken. So now, if, uh, for a given system, you can then uh, just, uh, let's, for example, take first a non-impacting system. Then I will have well-defined band states at every momentum k. I will have a band index, which I call alpha. 
So if you have such a dependence of the wave function, so uh, another thing you need to remember is that for all these things, you need to know the wave function itself. You cannot just have the energy levels. And now if you know the wave function as a function of k, you know how it depends on k, so therefore you can take the derivative, and then you uh, contract it with uh, the band state again. So that defines a vector potential, now a momentum space. So now, so these are uh, external gauge fields that depend on space time, but these are the things that depend only on the band structure uh, in <coughs> momentum space. And now, if you have a vector potential in momentum space, you can contract construct a field tensor in momentum space, and C1 is just an integral over such a field tensor. When you write these out, you again see that this is basically k, dk2, but epsilon. Uh, mu nu f mu nu, right? So this is just expressed ex explicitly how the indices were in two dimensional momentum space. So there you would have a rank two uh, epsilon tensor, but field tensor is also rank two. So rank two epsilon tensor contracts with the rank two field tensor naturally contracts in invariant quantity. So when you do an actual calculation, which I will do next slide, this is the expression for C1. And that is also called the first general. So again, all these mathematical quantity you can do by explicit calculation. So let me be even more explicit. So this is the model you will have seen over and over again. This is some kind of high binding model for fermions, non-impacting fermions in a lattice. That's the most generic notation. I can have any band, some band indices, beta uh, theta orbitals, and they little spins. And then I have a, a Hamiltonian uh, H. So now I couple them to external gauge field by a replacement of k goes to k minus e a, a the external field, and then expand out a into linear order. So this is the first term, and in the next order, I will get basically a couples to the current operator. Uh, Coupled to the current uh, operator. Uh, and then uh, you basically, uh, so when you look at the uh, effective fraction we're looking for, it's quadratic in the external field. So basically it means that I have a A here, A here, that current <coughs> vertex here. So it's a simple fermion, single loop diagram, very, very easy to find. So then you will get a uh, contribution, uh, it's exactly what I said. Uh, so when you have these uh, CK, which depends on, so this is a matrix which needs to be diagonalized, and the diagonalized matrix is this cat factor. And then you find that you can construct the gauge potential field tensor. And when you do the actual computation, you will find that this coefficient is C1. And this is called the first channel. Right. So now when you look at such an effective action, you try to understand now, so first argument I gave you is that this thing is only there when time reversal symmetry is broken. But now, oops, uh, now uh, you see that it actually implies the quantum Hall effect. Because if you take the functional derivative of this action with respect to A, you get a current, and you see that the current is given by this expression, and you just need to take out one component, let's say J of X, and you find this is partial y of a0. So that means current is perpendicular to the electric field, and that coefficient must be the whole coefficient, and that's the channel. So again, this is not the standard uh, derivation uh, for electrons over its lambda levels. It's uh, uh, much simpler. Okay? So this is a kind of, uh, but experimentally it has not yet been found uh, yet. This is something which I will call quantum anonymous part. It's coming from a high binding model. Right? <coughs> so the external field I'm only using as a probe. I'm not applying a large external magnetic field to the system. The original derivation by Fowler's and co-worker actually is much, much more complicated. So I think from now on, after the discovery of topological insulator, also pedagogically, when we teach the student about topological invariant, this is much, much simpler. We love the just from the time mining advanced. So now, let's take a particular case. So I have here a generic Hamiltonian matrix, depending on band indices alpha, beta, could be orbitals, could be spin. But let's take the simplest case, where this is a two by two matrix. So Hamiltonian has to be a Hamiltonian operator, a Hamiltonian matrix. So if I have a two band model, I can always expand that in the space of Pauli matrices and the identity matrix. So this is the identity matrix term. And if I have any generic two band model, I can expand this in terms of 
a, uh, sigma a, which are poly matrices, and the coefficient functions I will call dA. So uh, this is a three-dimensional vector d. Now, if I have a three-dimensional vector d, I can take its uh, normalized form, which is a unit vector. And so what you find, <coughs> so for a descaling Hamiltonian, you can then, uh, this is again a good exercise problem for all students to carry out, you can carry out this calculation explicitly for given Hamiltonian H, which is a 2 by 2 matrix. And after you've done all this calculation, you find another expression, which is uh, a specific expression uh, valid for 2 band model. You find that C1 is given by this expression. Now, that has a beautiful uh, geometrical or topological interpretation. So the real zone space is two dimensional and it's periodically identified. So therefore, the Brian zone space is a two torus, two-dimensional torus, periodically identified. Now, the d vector is a three vector, and if you normalize to its norm, it has a unit uh, direction. So that makes on the two sphere, a vector, three-dimensional vector with a un uh, normalized uh, length, is uh, 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 some vector that lives on the two sphere. So, these, so there's a natural mapping from the Brion zone torus to the space of the Hamiltonian, which now lives on the two sphere. So such a mapping, uh, you can just construct a Jacobian of such a mapping, and this factor is nothing but a Jacobian of such a mapping. So if you take a little area in your Brion torus, and that gap maps onto a little area on the sphere. And <coughs> so the, this is called the homotopy class of this two sphere. And uh, that, uh, by general argument, or you can uh, compute for any particular D that you take, uh, that this always comes out to be an integer. So this is again a very explicit example of, uh, of topology at work. And you see why you have the Brion zone uh, torus, why you have the two sphere, and why the mapping of this is uh, uh, this is worked out very explicitly. Uh, I forgot to give a reference in the 205 paper of our group. Why, why is the Brion zone torus? Oh, because it's periodically identified, right? If k plus 2 pi is the same as k equals to 0, <coughs> the periodic boundary condition. The, 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 if something in the x direction is periodic, in the y direction is periodic, topologically it's a torus. So now, uh, now you can take some uh, particular model. So this is just the upper block of the model that uh, Bernard Bekele and myself have constructed for Mercury Terra. Right? That's something I introduced to you yesterday. Uh, you understood what is the meaning of this M. Uh, these are the level <coughs> difference between the S and the P orbitals, and these are the off-diagonal uh, matrix elements, which has to be linear. And we expand out it. <coughs> so when you plot this function uh, in the, using the notation of a D vector, you find that D is a three-dimensional vector. Uh, this is a two, you can actually uh, represent the torus uh, just by a square, but remember these are periodically identified. So now, uh, this d vector, at the center, it is up, but at the brilliant boundary, it's down. But in the middle, it makes a vortex <coughs> configuration. So such a configuration is sometimes also called a skirmion configuration. And uh, that uh, kind of thing describes a winding number one mapping from the brilliant zone torus to the two speed. So now, when you put this given model, you can then construct, uh, carry out this integral. And you see that the integral jumps from 0 to 1 when m changes sign from positive to negative. So this is again an indication why changing the mass m uh, leads to a topological phase transition. So infinitesimal change of m across 0 leads to a finite jump in the topological invariance. So this is a result that was known in quantum field theory or topological field theory, which I studied. I was a student in field theory. So I knew about this remarkable result that if you change the sign of the Dirac mass, the topological invariant jumps discontinuously. Uh, more than 30 years ago, I learned that. So then when on the day came that we're looking for topological insulator and I saw this plot with mercury terrorized sinking below everything else divided by the zero gap line, that's the moment when we realized that mercury terrorized is a topologically non trivial material. That's how the discovery was made. So this kind of thing is mathematical, but very, very useful in material science. And that's at least one example. So now, again, you have this uh, effective action. When you look at the linear response, 
you find that ji is equal to epsilon ij times e, so this is nothing but the whole equation. It tells you both the longitudinal whole conductance is zero, and the off diagonal whole conductance is a topological number, which always has to be integer, and sometimes when you change the mass, it can change its continuity. So now this was an explicit calculation for a non-interacting system. How do you generalize this to an arbitrary interacting system? So that turns out that this C1 for arbitrary interacting system, then the Brinks function for interacting system is well defined. It's a still, it's a single particle Brinks function that's a well defined uh, object for an interacting system. So then this C1, uh, the first term number for interacting system, that so gets expressed in this particular way. So the Brinks function being non-singular lives on this space, and now this thing describes the homotopy path of that space, and that's again into Now this is a little bit more mathematical, but this is a very useful mathematical result. It tells you how to generalize uh, this to an interacting system, and more later we will talk about it. So this, again, uh, I, uh, as I tell you, that this is a simple bank model, right? There's no lambda rules. So that is the effect which we now call quantum anonymous Hall effect. So you see there's a Hall effect uh, and anonymous Hall effect, both discovered by Hall more than 100 years ago, and more recently we have the spin Hall effect. And the so Hall effect has the quantum version, spin Hall effect has the quantum spin Hall effect uh, discovered now in the mercury parallel to the dimensional quantum well, but there still is one missing, and that is a system which has no external magnetic field but can uh, break time reversal symmetry by the spontaneous formation of the magnetic moment. Magnetic moment is different from magnetic field. Magnetic field has an orbital effect. Magnetic moment only has a spin coupling effect. So that's fundamentally different. But that is still a system that we're looking for. There's no experimental realization yet. So now we have proposals that uh, our, our basic idea is that these topological insulators uh, provide a natural platform this uh, by itself, and this is a response to Matthias' question yesterday, what happens when you break time reversal symmetry in topological insulators? This is one way you break, you introduce magnetic moments. Uh, so we <coughs> suppose that the topological insulator is a natural platform to realize quantum anonymous software. You just need to introduce magnetic moments, manganese uh, or chromium or iron into these topological insulators. Now what is the fundamental idea? The fundamental idea is that, uh, let's go back to the problem of mercury pairwise again. So it has these two level crossing, but these levels are each doubly degenerate. One describes spin up block, the other describes the spin down block. So the blue is double degenerate, the red is double degenerate. So this is again the schematic representation that you have these S levels uh, crossing the P level, and that corresponds to this difference, corresponds to uh, the Dirac mass for the effective Dirac equation, and that's changing sign, and on the negative side, it's topologically non trivial. Now, once time reversal symmetry is spoken, so when time reversal symmetry is there, the blue and the red has to be strictly degenerate. But when the time reversal symmetry is broken, they can split. That's nothing but the exchange splitting. So if the exchange splitting occurs, then when you turn the thickness parameter or any other tuning parameter, then the quantum phase transition does not have to occur in a degenerate fashion. So the red can occur first, and then blue can occur later. So then it will give you a window where the red is already that's uh, spin up, plus means spin up. The spin up is already topologically non-trivial, but the spin down is still trivial. And this is nothing but a whole effect. Here, both are transitioning at the same time. Spin up gives you e squared over h, spin down has to give you by time reversal symmetry minus e squared over h. <coughs> so the net charge Hall effect is equal, the net spin Hall effect is now zero, of course, therefore the name quantum spin Hall effect. But now that they don't happen at the same time, it gives you a window in which the spin up is already non trivial, but the spin down is still trivial. So that will have a net positive charge Hall effect. And that's the meaning of quantum anonymous Hall effect. And so more uh, in this schematic diagram, so you see the spin Hall effect as upspin and downspin strictly degenerate uh, if time reversal symmetry is present. Now, by introducing magnetic moments, you break time reversal symmetry. Now, when you remember the, by solving this explicit model, which I assigned for the students to do, there's actually a localization length. Now, in the time reversal symmetry case, the two localization lengths for up and down has to be strictly the same. But now that local, uh, the time reversal symmetry is spoken, they can have different localization lengths. So you can make the blue one fatter and fatter 
but the red one thinner and thinner, more localized, blue one more, more delocalized. And then at one point, they go into the box, they can behave themselves. So they end up with just one bit of edge state. So this is the quantum anonymous false state. And that is something which we are now actively looking for to realize experimentally. There are already some uh, these are reasonable theoretical ideas. We even have material uh, proposals. And so the idea is how to find this uh, experimentally. So now the proposal is to put iron or chromium into bismuth uh, selenite topological insulator, or put manganese into mercury paralyte topological insulator. And so we see that, that even in the insulating uh, limit, they can order these moments, could order ferromagnetically. And uh, once they order ferromagnetically, uh, for some uh, cases uh, they are uh, metal, but for uh, some other cases they are insulator, and they give rise to this quantum anonymous order. And this material, uh, because the time reversal symmetry is broken, you only need to consider one block of uh, Hamiltonian, not both blocks. And that is exactly the model I discussed earlier, which gives rise to the quantum anonymous model. Do you need all magnetic spins parallel? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. So you have to uh, have a sense of the direction. Okay. So now let me, so this is, uh, so this, uh, is pedagogical. It's uh, the simplest case of a topological field theory in two plus one dimension, <coughs> but now coming from uh, a band model. So now let's uh, move on to the time reversal invariant topological insulator, say bismuth selenide, bismuth terabyte. So we give some very simple band picture of why there's something special. There's some crossing point that's protected by time reversal symmetry. <coughs> but now these are only band pictures. Uh, the the uh, non interacting system doesn't exist in nature. We have to ask if these topological insulators are stable. Are they stable against interactions? Can you give a general definition of topological insulator? in the presence of the interaction. So I gave you already the proof, right? So if you want to search for topology, the only thing you need to look for is the epsilon tensor. Okay? So now if you are in 3 plus 1 dimension, what's the epsilon you can write down? That's the epsilon tensor you can write down. Okay? So then you say that so then the only way to do something is to contract with the two f's that you have from Maxwell's uh, q Okay. So you see, the Maxwell term e squared minus b squared is f contracted with f using the metric tensor, geometrical. Here, it's f contracted with f, but with the epsilon tensor, which is knows nothing about the metric. Even in curved space, it will be that term. Okay? So for that reason, this is actually a topological term. And when you expand it out in components, it's e dot b, Maxwell's e squared minus b squared. So this is just under value level ENF, E dot B, uh, how do you express that in the field uh, invariant tensor? So. so now that in general can have a coefficient, just like here you would have a coefficient of dielectrical constant magnetic permeability. If you have E dot B, generically it can have a coefficient, which we call theta, and properly normalized, it has this other in the fine structure constant. So now again, by a similar argument, you can compute for a given, let's say if you have a non interacting system, for a given band structure, you can compute what's theta. And here's the algorithm again that if you have the band states, you have k, and now you have the band index beta, you can again construct a uh, vector potential. So now we are even considering off diagonal components, not just the diagonal components uh, between the band indices. And all of so this is something like a non abelian vector. And out of that, you can construct the non abelian field tensor, that which also includes this commutative term. So now we're in three space dimension. You have a three-dimensional Brion zone, uh, the three topos, and so you have a D3K, right? So now out of this A and F, you can form a beautiful uh, topological invariant, which is called the Chen Simons term. So Chen Simons term has a three, uh, after everything, it has three indices and that beautifully contracts with the epsilon index of 1, 2, 3 in referring to space. So if you give me any band structure, I can calculate for you what this uh, theta is. So physically, uh, what this means is the following. So actually, <coughs> this is theta, uh, this is uh, theta, uh, so this is this field tensor term written out in the form of E dot D. So now uh, you can prove that for any time reversal invariant system, uh, this theta, uh, uh, so uh, uh, first of all, uh, so this, uh, in doing this calculation, you say, I have to take some basis to construct my wave function. 
So if I choose some other basis, uh, what happens? So that will correspond to some gauge transformation on this A. So it turns out that unlike the previous case, if you did a gauge transformation, uh, the trend number C1 doesn't change at all. But in this particular case, because it does not only involve field strength, which is invariant under gauge transformation, it also involves A explicitly, which changes under gauge transformation. So you find a remarkable thing that this quantity may not be so well defined, that after the gauge transformation, theta can change. But what you can prove is that after gauge transformation, theta can change, but A only can change by 2 pi. You cannot change arbitrarily. So the whole system has a periodicity. When you change theta by <coughs> theta going to 2 pi, it is the same thing. It's up to a gauge transformation. So now, uh, when we usually write down such a term, E dot B, and the reason we usually don't write them down is because this term breaks time reversal. E is even, B is odd at the time reversal. So theta goes to minus theta under the time reversal. So now there's two important conditions. One is that theta, by changing theta by 2 pi, nothing matters. And under time reversal, theta goes to minus theta. So these two facts combined together tells you that in a time reversal invariant system, there are only two possible choices for theta. Either theta can be zero, obviously this term is not there, it's time reversal invariant. But then there's also a non-trivial case when theta is equal to pi. Then under time reversal, pi goes to minus pi, but minus pi and pi can be related to each other simply by gauge transformation, as I argued here, as you can prove explicitly. And therefore, uh, theta equals to pi is also a time reversal invariant form. So this is the absolutely remarkable fact, that if you have a material, you couple them to external electromagnetic fields, you integrate out, and this is again, the material, you can change your Hamiltonian a little bit, uh, some parameter was 2, now you change to 3, what happens? Epsilon and mu will always change, right? But if you have a time reversal invariant system, when you change the parameter, theta can either jump discontinuously from pi to zero, or it cannot change at all. This is the meaning of topological invariant, and tells you what is the thing to measure physically, what's quantizing topological insulate. So topological insulate has this theta term, and for the non-trivial case, Theta is non trivial, equals to, precisely equals to pi. You cannot change it at all. Yeah? So, so, so what do you mean pi goes to minus pi? Is it any one test of time sources? No, no, no. Pi and minus pi are the same thing. Ah. Uh, so, they are the same. So, so, you can, physics cannot depend on the choice of gauge, right? So, if uh, I gave you an algorithm to compute theta, <coughs> I also gave you an algorithm to compute C1. If you, did a gate, if you make a different choice of the band states, a will change, but C1 cannot change, because C1 only depends on F. But here, if I you make a different band basis, A will change, but this expression does not only depend on F, it also depends on A. So therefore, it could in principle change. But you can prove that it can only change by 2 pi. So 2 pi, changing theta by 2 pi, is a period of the system. The effective action of the theory is independent when you change theta by, by 2 pi. Right? So now I have a topological insulate. So this is the simplest thing to uh, understand is that if you have a one-dimensional ring, and I put a magnetic flux through the ring, for a generic value of magnetic flux, I break time reversal symmetry. But there are only two values of the flux where time reversal symmetry is preserved, and that's why the flux is equal to zero or pi. But the thing is that you cannot construct two dimensional theory, so you, I mean, you assume there is some kind of integration out of there or magic, right? What? You assume that there's a magic, right? Which then leads to the speed, right? I mean, no, there's no magic. Any model you give me, I can compute what theta is. No, no, I mean, I mean so how is it, it is fundamental, right? I mean, for example, low mass operation, mm -hmm. mass is mass of action, right? Mass what? Mass of action. Right? Mass of action, yeah. It's 1 over 5, so pi is pi. So, right? so it's a magic condition, right? But now you're saying I change the sign, right? And then I have to shift my condition by 2 pi, right? Yeah. No, 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 for a given model, you can do different computations by choosing different gauge. No, no, I mean, if you can give me six, or whatever. Yeah. yeah. You're, you're giving a microscopic model. Yes, I'm giving a microscopic model. which you're computing the band states. No, 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 I'm giving a microscopic model. I'm sorry. I mean, this is a No, no, this is a Lagrangian which you get after you integrate out the Fermi. Oh, this, oh, 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 okay. so, so, so that's what I'm saying. So, you should not consider this as fundamental, right? So, you should consider this as having after some equation, right? Which, which occurs when you remove some of these previous. 
Yeah, that's what, exactly what I said. You have a microscopic Hamiltonian. You would like to understand what the microscopic Hamiltonian is doing by doing a physical measurement. And these are the things you can measure. If I couple my insulation to the external electromagnetic field, I measure something. And I will show you what's the measurement. It's Faraday rotation. Now you, need to, you also like to compute that. You like to measure it, but you also like to compute it theoretically. This is the algorithm to compute it theoretically. Right. So this is as fundamental as it can be. To uh, give you the full description, you have a model upon which you can compute what this is. Uh, and what this is depends on the gauge choice of your advanced states. But you can only change the answer by two parts. Is that clear enough? Yeah. So therefore, it gives you a fundamental definition of what the interacting topological insulator means. It is an insulator that, so for all time reversal invariant insulators, it can either be zero or five. Again, to understand why there are two values that uh, refer back to this analogy of a one-dimensional system. If you have a one-dimensional periodic ring, and spreading a flux generally breaks time reversal. But there's two values of the flux where time reversal is not broken. That's when the flux is equal to zero or pi, and in proper units is HD over two. Yeah. Um, let me make make sure I understand one thing. Can you go back one slide? Yeah. Uh, so you have a, a, a generalized uh, gauge invariance here of your entire uh, system. The Maxwell action is, is invariant under abelian transformations. Yeah. Very, very the other good. action yeah. is yeah. invariant yeah. under non abelian yeah. Yeah. transformations. So, uh, yeah. so the abelian is the gauge transformation where you know from the Maxwell. From the ordinary, yeah. What I'm here saying is a different gauge transformation yeah. okay. of the band states. That's, there's some convention you which is arbitrary you introduce to define the phase factors of the band states. And that can in general change theta, but it can change theta only by two pi. Mm -hmm. And that's the beautiful thing you can prove about the integral of the transaminous okay. does, that, does that correspond to a particular So this group? is, a, again, think about the case that if you're an uh, ant living in a one-dimensional ring, yeah. you cannot possibly tell whether you spread the flux of Tc over 2e or four times h d over 2, because the boundary condition on your system is always the same. <coughs> you, you give you an anti boundary condition. Okay. So this is the deep meaning of what topology, and this is remarkable. It can be explained, well, the, fi well, the derivation, of course, is a little more complex. But the final answer can be expressed at the end of the level. It's E dot B. The, and E and B are the ordinary external electromagnetic field, but with a coefficient which is strictly quantized to be theta equals to pi. And if you change your material parameters, you're changing epsilon and mu, but you cannot change theta, or you can only change theta <coughs> discontinuously. And the way you change it discontinuously, you have to collapse the band gap and then reopen. That's the only way. So that gives you the sense, true meaning of what the topological state of matter is. You have a gap system, you have a quantized response, and when you change your Hamiltonian a little bit, you can not change this value. And that's what quantization means, and that's what topology means. It's a measurable thing, it's not just an abstract mathematical concept. Now, what is the thing that you're measuring? And that, again, goes back to Matthias' question, and that you have to, uh, and the, another interesting exercise you do is that E dot B looks like a bulk term. But we also learn from Maxwell theory that E and B are not fundamental quantities. Uh, a is, right? So you express E and B in terms of A, or F mu nu in terms of derivative of A. You find that this thing that looks like a bulk term indeed actually is a surface term. Okay? So if it's a surface, if it's a der total derivative, right? So if it's a total derivative, then you can express it on the surface. So it's a bulk integral, but because it's a total derivative, it only depends on the surface. But it's the derivative of the transcendence term. Okay? So now you can understand what it means physically. So now if it's a derivative of the transcendence term, then it can be expressed as a surface integral of the transcendence term. But the transcendence term in 2 plus 1 dimension means the whole effect. Right? And the coefficient of the transcendence term means what's the value of the whole effect, as we previously discussed. So now, the interesting and funny thing is that in the previous slide, I proved to you the coefficient of the transcendence term always has to be quantized in an integer in units of e squared over h. 
Now let's see what happens when theta is equals to pi. Theta equals to pi, when you translate into a proper unit, tells you that it gives you a value of one half e squared over h, a value which is absolutely forbidden, well, for a non interacting system at least, for a uh, two dimensional system. Okay? So that's why this is only possible because it's a surface term. <laughs> so it is, the surface is a two plus one dimensional system, but it has a value of the transcendence coefficient which is not allowed in a strict two dimensional system. So this effect can only occur as a surface effect of a three-dimensional thing. And that thing has a one-half e squared over h. So now this may be a little bit more mathematical, so let's make it simpler and simpler and simpler. So let's go back to a case maybe some of you are already familiar with, and that's the case of graphene. So the second uh, paper, there's two consecutive papers uh, in graphene. The second paper, when they proved that graphene is a, a strict one monolayer, they did that by measuring the whole effect. So when they measured the whole effect, they gave the plot uh, in order to publish in nature that uh, these forms precisely quantize plateaus in units of one half. Okay? One half of what? One half of <coughs> four e squared over h. Okay? Plotting one half is quite impressive, but it's in units of four e squared over h. Now why is 4 e squared of h. There's a very good reason, because there are four derived forms in graphene. So it's kind of natural to plot these in units of four. And that means that if you had only one derived form, it will give you one half. But you don't have one, uh, only one derived form. Just as I explained yesterday, you can never ever have one uh, derived form in a two-dimensional, strict two-dimensional system. But it is possible when it is the two-dimensional system is the boundary of a three-dimensional system. And that is one half exactly means that you have a single zero form on the surface. So everything is consistent. <coughs> Theta equals to pi means you only have one zero form on the surface. And one zero form is not something you can have in a two-dimensional system, but you can have it as the boundary of a three-dimensional system. So now you see the physical meaning, what this uh, topological field theory means. It actually is telling you that the surface in the non-interacting picture, we can talk about development and so on. So in that limit, it tells you that there's a single development on the surface, something that's strictly forbidden in a strict two-dimensional system. Now, how, uh, what is actually going on is that the surface actually, if the topological insulator is insulated in the ball, but conducts on the surface. So if something conducts on the surface, uh, it's not really insulated. So what we propose to do is actually to make a true topological insulator which is both insulating the ball and on the surface. And you can only do that, there's only one way to do that, and that's to introduce magnetism on the surface. So you break time reversal symmetry only on the surface, not in the ball. Okay, so it does not change any of the ball arguments. So then, if you have this single derived by introducing magnetic moments, a gap opens up. And once a gap opens up, you are of course allowed to have a whole effect on the surface, and then it predicts that the whole effect has to be strictly quantized into a one-half value, which is normally forbidden for a strict two-dimensional system. So there's some subtlety of the arguments involved, but you see the beautiful nature of the argument, the periodicity, bulk edge correspondence, and it all boils down to a total derivative. Okay? If you have a total derivative, bulk becomes surface. So now this also generalizes to a general definition of a topological insulator. <coughs> How much time do I have? Almost time. Few minutes. Few minutes. So let me go very fast. So then we also give you a general definition of what a top so what this value theta is. Uh, I gave you a prescription here how to compute it uh, for the band states. If you have band states, but you say, well, this is not satisfactory. What if I have an interacting system? I don't know what that means. What uh, I can say k means. But you do know what Green's function means for an interacting system. So maybe I will not go into details. But the upshot is that. If you have an interacting system, you know what the, you in principle know what the interacting Green functions are. And then you can do an integral, and that always comes out to be an integer. But again, there's an ambiguity in the calculation, but the ambiguity is only modular to pi. And that's why it only defines the evenness, only the evenness or the hardness of the integer is uh, physical. So now here comes to the exciting physics. So now uh, we have a new term in the Maxwell action with a precisely quantized coefficient. And that changes the Maxwell equation. Okay? And give you some remarkable effect. 
they give you a topological magnetoelectric. <laughs> so that if you have a insulator and you apply a magnetic field, you get electric polarization. When you apply electric field, they give you a magnetic polarization. And the coefficient of proportionality is strictly quantized, that in proper units with the diagonals of time. And so this is again, uh, you, the way you do that is you take the topological insulator, but then put the magnetic moments, and the magnetic moments will open up again. So that is something that was theoretically predicted uh, by our group, and then experimentally observed in the Stanford uh, photo emission group. So there they studied when you put magnetic impurity, uh, uh, non-magnetic impurity, the Dirac home is still intact. But when you put magnetic impurity into the system, the Dirac home opens up again. And the gap is actually quite sizable, close to 40 million electron volts. So it can even be useful for room temperature uh, operations. So what it does is that you can also realize something like chiral states for the three-dimensional topology. I give you a prescription of how to realize this for the two-dimensional topological insulator simply by putting magnetic moments everywhere in the two-dimensional quantum realm. In a three-dimensional topological insulator, you put magnetic moments, again for you, this is almost, uh, a lot of, uh, maybe the most interesting physics comes about actually when you break the time reversal symmetry on the surface of the topological insulator. So you put a ferromagnetic moment, and uh, if uniform ferromagnetic moment covers the sample, it's just an insulation everywhere. But if the ferromagnetic moment makes a domain wall, and usually it does, then on the domain wall there lives a one-dimensional chiral state on the domain <coughs> wall between. So you have a 3D system, surface 2D, 2D you cover it with magnetic moment, and then you make a domain wall, which is finally one dimension. So then on the sample, you were uh, at the intersection, uh, at the uh, place where the domain wall lives, there is a parallel uh, edge state. So this is the kind of thing, this is ideal for application. It's a true highway system where you can transport currents, dissipation. Well, I mean, you can do two tracks. Either uh, spin some vacation, uh, and a plane that can be cleared Very, very, or, very, very good this, question. This, yeah, this very, very, very good question. So you, when you look at the Dirac model, uh, it has uh, uh, three sigma poly matrices, and you have some kx sigma x plus ky sigma y. When you put a moment in the xy direction, it only shifts the momentum. Only when you put a moment, uh, magnetic moment in the z direction, you can open it again. So they break time reversal symmetry in different ways. When you put a moment in the plane, it shifts the Dirac form, but still gapless. But when the moment lies perpendicular, it opens up again. That, uh, so it has to be ising, and the ising direction is selected by the surface normal. It's a kind of cycloidal, yeah? What people call it nail, then I don't know. Yeah, that I don't know. But so, uh, at least this is a uh, well defined But wait, is it fundamental Because the surface breaks the inversion symmetry. The bulk model is inversion symmetric. The surface normal breaks the inversion. That's why there's a preferential direction selected by the It shifts the Dirac form. Because the Dirac Hamiltonian is sigma x uh, kx plus sigma y ky. When you put a moment in the x uh, y direction it, uh, by Zeeman coupling, it simply shifts k to a k prime. Right, right. And that's not open up again. Right, but I mean, if I don't do, 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 do one straight, I have to. If, if you don't want to do what? If I do one straight, I have to take a bar, right? Then I will have to do right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And, then, and then you do this uh, time loss as well? Yeah, but it's it's only, but there's a problem about gas. There is, no, but there is a transition between the balance band surface and conduction. Yeah. So, so yeah. Why, why does it does that? No, no, no. It will give you something, but it's not an insulator. I claim I want to study a true insulator which is both insulating on the surface and in the bulb. And that only happens when a magnetic moment is perpendicular to the surface. Otherwise, it's not an insulator. Right? It's a metal. You can study the metal, but I'm not interested in metal at the moment. I'm interested in a true insulator. And that only achieved by a magnetic moment perpendicular to the plane. I mean, you don't need to have any motion direction, so you can just if you have the theory, you just break and move to the surface, right? By, by just, I reach the right? 
Yeah, but so you have to, yeah. You, you but if you want to get an effective action that's local, you have to have start as an insulin. Otherwise, you get a non local effect. Exactly, that's right. But any, even as a short intervention, you break the gap. Yeah, but I tell you, I want to open it. Otherwise, I do, you don't get a local effective action. It's not an insulin. Yeah, yeah. Then the question is, you define what you have. No, no, it shifts to the rock point, it's still massless. It depends on the direction of the moment. If the moment is in the plane, it shifts to the rock point, it's still gathering. If it's perpendicular, it will just up again. So then it also, maybe, maybe let's put this on the last slide. So then it's also. Uh, well, one of the striking experiments for signature is that it gave you these images back, that if you put an electric charge above such a topological insulator, the image charge is a magnetic monopole. And that's because the E dot E term converts electrically into magnetic E. And that you can image. And the Stanford experiment is a to do that. And also you can uh, do, uh, and so, so you can do a magnetic Ah? No, no, no. But they are actively pursuing that as there are many other uh, yeah, in the world. And then the other is that you get a crow rotation and a Faraday rotation, and there's a particular combination which is strictly quantized. Both are dimensionless quantity, but they are not quantized in units of alpha, the fine structure constant. So this maybe is the last slide. <laughs> that uh, that in, uh, we talk about unit system in physics, but the unit system is very strange. They're expressed in terms of meters and these arbitrary quantities, right? Even, uh, but uh, the best way to introduce a unit system is to define all fundamental units in terms of quantization phenomena. Okay, so in solid state physics, we already have flux quantization, we see in the 2E, we have quantized Hall effect, H, uh, E squared over H. Now finally, the topological insulator gives you a quantization in units of alpha defined structure constant. So if you have all three quantization phenomena, we can completely redefine fundamental units in nature. That you define E, H, and C, not in terms of meters and arbitrary quantities like that, but in terms of fundamental complex phenomena. Thank you. Um, yesterday you showed us some of the recent results from Brooks' work, where they showed <coughs> yeah. quantum Hall effect <coughs> yes. Yes. on yeah. uh, the right as right. yeah. a 3D topology. Yes, very good right. question. So that's consistent with that. They do, do they see the, the single direct cone, or do they see both surfaces? Ah, yeah, so they actually see both surfaces. Okay. So, so, it's, yeah. so you get one half, yeah, half quantum Hall effect on one surface and half quantum Hall effect on the other surface. When you make a contact, you cannot distinguish. Mm -hmm. But what you can distinguish is by doing this experiment. So if you do this experiment, you can actually determine what's the whole effect on the upper surface and what's the experiment on the lower surface. And that again has not yet been done. So there's a lot of very exciting experiments, and that really pushes uh, precision measurements to the extreme to, 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 to determine this phenomenon. Yeah, that's a very good question. Yeah. In the experiment which you <coughs> just flashed of the magnetic impurities, yeah, uh, yes. these were impurities immersed in the bulk, right? Yeah, very, very good question. Okay. So then I have to go to the previous slide. So now you, uh, you, you let's imagine the idealized theoretical limit. Uh, the one problem that uh, these materials still have is that they're not really actually insulating us in the bulk, uh, which is a problem. But let's say we reach the best sample we have, strictly insulating in the bulk but uh, conducting with a single electron on the surface. Let's now introduce magnetic moments. When the, when the magnetic moments are introduced in the bulk, the bulk cannot mediate a long range interaction because it's fully gapped. On the other hand, the surface has conducting fermions, and they can mediate an RKKY-like interaction. The interesting thing is that the RKKY-like interaction does not oscillate when the Fermi level lies at the Dirac point because there's no KF. And when you compute it, it actually so. But then you have only two possibilities: either ferromagnetic or antiferromagnetic. And when you actually do a computation, you find it's always ferromagnetic. So there's a preferential 
propensity of ordering on the surface, less propensity of ordering in the bulk. So that's consistent. But the Dirac point is not generically lying in the Fermi level. Uh, it should be if it's an idealized material. And the, it's a charge neutrality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and what they did in the Stanford experiment is very, very clever. So what we proposed as a theorist is to have isovalent substitution by chromium or iron. And that actually doesn't work that well, uh, even though theoretically it should work the best. What they did is introduce manganese rather than the isovalent filament. So you know these systems are to begin with electron gold. So they shoot two birds with one stone. Mm -hmm. By putting manganese, both lowers the Fermi level and introduces magnetic order. And we assume it enough, it can really shoot two birds and with one stone. And that's, I went too fast. That's actually what went down in the experiment. The going direction is a pair of counter the gate, one or a square? Uh, yeah, one with R squared. R squared, yeah. yeah. Uh, there was a question in the. Oh, R cubed, actually. Yeah, so their large distance is a constant, so it's an RQ. Why? RQ is usually a 3D. Yeah, but it says something has to do with the Dirac point. Can you elaborate more on the churn, churn number in the case of interactions? Is yeah, it okay. Is approximation? Is it exact? It's exact, yeah. So, so uh, yeah, so, uh, so there's two formulas. <coughs> So if you have an interacting system in true plus one dimension, uh, the prescription of using these uh, band states to calculate is no longer valid, but the Green's function is generally valid. So the expression, so the Green's function in true plus one dimension is a function with three arguments, two momentum k and one omega. So I can label them by three k. Okay? And then the Green's function generally lives. Uh, so you, you, you know, more, know almost nothing about Green's function, what's the symmetry property, and you're not allowed to use any when you have an interaction system. The only assumption is that it's now singular. So it's an element of general linear transformation uh, with a non-zero determinant, or in other words, it's invertible. But uh, strikingly, pi to be of that is an integer. The third point of it. So now, uh, you get, uh, so this is uh, more obvious, but uh, the less obvious is the formula we derived here, that if you have a uh, interacting uh, system in for three plus one dimension of parabola, and then the Green's function G is a function of uh, four arguments, three K and one omega. So for that, you can get K4, okay? But there's nothing about pi four that's non-trivial about general linear transformations. But pi five is not the fifth homotopy class. And that deeply is related to the fact that the next quantum Hall effect, so when you write down transcendence term, you can only write down for odd space time dimension. So if you have a uh, two plus one dimensional transcendence term, if you want to maintain that structure, again, you look at the epsilon tensor indices, you have to jump to four plus one dimension. So in four plus one dimension, there's a non-trivial second chain class, and you have to use that. And the way you use that is that you give me a Hamiltonian that you're interested in, in three plus one dimension. I construct another Hamiltonian. And you are, you are interested in to know whether your Hamiltonian is trivial or not trivial. I construct another Hamiltonian for which I know for sure it's trivial. Okay? So I call my Hamiltonian at u equals to one, and your Hamiltonian at u equals to zero. Then I find a path of interpolation between your Hamiltonian and my Hamiltonian. Okay? So then my Green's function will depend parametrically on you, on this interpolation parameter. And then uh, finally we'll construct this expression. Okay, so then it, uh, it, it depends on five, <coughs> five integrals. And pi five of that is non trivial. And this integral will always come out to be integer. But this I be good because he can introduce another trivial Hamiltonian. And he can interpolate to you also. The question is whether we will get the same thing or not. And the answer is no, we generally don't agree. But we will agree on the parity of the integer. And that's why it's Z2. <coughs> yeah. Um, so when you introduce a chance that my question is trivial. Oh, no, it's okay. I interpolate it to an trivial one. It is a case of graphene. Yeah. Ideal uh, graphene sheet yeah. and isolated one. 
right? Yeah. So then you have a uh, like direct port, you have no, no, no gas. Yeah. So you consider that as a 2D system that is free. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so you have no the political state there? Yeah. No. You mean you need, you need a, 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 a graphene sheet that is interacting with the. No, no, I never gas. said graphene is tribute. Uh, I never said uh, graphene is tribute, yeah, yeah. topologically tribute, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. But so you, it has, uh, but so you, in graphene, there's a similarity to the surface state of a topologically non trivial insulin. Only the difference is the number of the rock okay. Graphene has four, but the surface, just as I proved to you in the previous lecture, mm -hmm. has one the rock mm -hmm. And to one versus four mm -hmm. is different. Because four will give you a theta which is equal to four pi, which is the same as zero. But one can give you pi, which is different from you, okay. because the periodicity is too high. Okay, but thanks for coming in.